G'day and welcome to Inside Rugby. My name is Mark and I'm a Kiwi rugby fan living here in beautiful Cancun in Mexico. And if you haven't been with us before on this channel, welcome. It's great to have you here. And if you're one of my loyal supporters on this channel, thank you very much for watching another video. Your presence and support of my community is very, very much appreciated. So thank you for being here. Now in today's episode, something a little bit different. I'm going to be doing my first interview on this rugby channel of a rugby player from South Africa who's got lots of interesting stuff to share with us. So as a result of that, this episode's a little bit longer, but if you're a true rugby fan, then you should love every part of it. We talked to him about his journey away from South Africa and playing overseas, what happened along the way to him and his family. And also we went through in detail about the Rugby World Cup this year. So some really interesting stuff in this episode. We talk about what he thinks World Rugby needs to do to improve the game. And we've got a little bit of a surprise in there about a subject that's very close to my heart at the moment. So there we go, plenty to listen to and to watch in this episode. Let's get over there right now, meet this rugby player and get right into it. Don't forget to leave all your thoughts afterwards in the comments. Until then, see you soon. So it's a very warm welcome to Inside Rugby today to South African rugby player Scott Van Breeder. Scott, welcome to the show, mate. Hi Mark, thank you much for having me. Looking forward to it. Now tell us all, um, got lots of uh, listeners and viewers all over the world here on Inside Rugby and they'd probably want to know whereabouts in the world are you talking to us from today? Uh, at the moment I'm in Jersey in the Channel Islands at the moment, a tiny little island off the coast of the UK. And you've had some pretty bad weather in the last week or so, is that right? Some of the houses have been blown away? Yeah, a bit of a crazy. Last week we had what they called it Storm Kieran, and there was actually a little tornado that ripped through a small section east of the island, which was caused quite some devastation. So we're still picking up the pieces from that, but um, everyone's doing all right, thankfully. Oh, that's good news. It's uh, As we say, houses can be rebuilt, but when people's lives get injured, that's not too good at all. So good news on, on that exactly. front. Listen, uh, thanks very much for coming on the show today. Lots happening in the rugby world at the moment. Of course, we've had the Rugby World Cup, and as a South African, you'd be a very happy man today I'm sure of that and uh, we're going to chat about that later on in the show but I thought we'd start off by giving my viewers and audience an opportunity to get to know who you are Scott and uh, a little bit about your background so where did life start off for you in the beginning where's uh, where's hometown? Uh, well I was actually fun enough born in Joburg my parents lived there but then we moved to Cape Town when I was three so Cape Town I consider my hometown and Sort of grew up there. I was like, I went to Rundebosch Boys Prep School, Rundebosch Boys High School. I had a really good time in Cape Town, and then so that's where my grounding came before moving up to the Eastern Cape. After that, fantastic. So uh, great place, Cape Town. I've got a little bit of history there, and places like Clifton and Camps Bay, and uh, visited uh, that part of the world. It's a it's a fantastic part of the world, isn't it? Yeah, man. I mean, it's not too many better places in the world than Cape Town. It's got the mountain, the beaches, the golf courses, the wine farms, anything you need you can find in, down in Cape Town. I guess growing up there and, and of course being a South African, you were thrown into sport at a fairly young age. Were you a, a rugby guy right from school days? Um, to be honest, I was probably well, always rugby. I loved rugby, but cricket as well. Cricket was sort of, I was a bit better at, better at it when I was younger. So that sort of took me through. Cricket was my main sport all the way until probably matric where Rugby sort of really kicked on just quite late for me because I developed late. So I was sort of finding out from the hooker all the way through junior school. Then, so then I grew, so I turned to lock because I was still slow. Eventually, when I was 16, I decided I'm just going to go play, play fullback and have some fun. And that's where things kicked on after that. Were you a good uh, cricket player? Yeah, I did sort of enjoy it quite a bit. So I played like provincial cricket, not provincial rugby. So it was my main sport up until, up until after school where I decided to go the rugby route. But I loved I love my cricket as well, it's just to open the bowling and could bat a little bit every now and then. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, hang on a second, I just want to make sure we... Uh... Yeah, okay, so that's, that's cool. So when, did, uh, when would you say you got really serious about your rugby? Um, so sort of after school I finished my trick and I was sort of in between do I go straight to UCT and study or go on a gap year? A few of my friends would come to the UK on a gap year, but sort of 
halfway through my matric year, they changed the, the laws for your visas. So it was a bit trickier for me because I just had a South African passport. And then my dad found out they did what they used to call post matrix at Kingswood College up in Grahamstown. And basically I went there. You could either repeat your school subjects or because my marks were more than good enough, I sort of did um, a couple of university subjects in anticipation for what I was planning on studying the year after. And then at the same time, I could play school sports. Um, so then that's where sort of the rugby and cricket again had a good year. And a couple of my old school coaches moved to um, the Southern Kings or the EP Kings and started the academy. And from there, I, they offered me a chance to come join the academy. And I never looked back after that. Yeah, fantastic. And did uh, a lot of your mates that you were playing with uh, in the early days, did they go along with you as well on that journey? Um, there was actually two guys from my school who came to Kingswood with me. Um, one of them also ended up coming to the academy. The other one went back to Stellenbosch to go study because he wanted to do viticulture. So he went back to study sort of um, wine making and that side of things. And then, yeah, so I had one mate who came with me from Kingswood. Another mate ended up coming to the King's Academy when we went there my first year. <coughs> um, and then, yeah, I just loved sort of the Eastern Cape. But Port Elizabeth, it became like, oh, it's almost like a mini Cape Town. And then once I got used to that, like, nice, relaxed lifestyle, it was, it was happy days. And then I met my... Didn't realize then, but my wife at Kingswood, who's now my wife now, so it's been a long journey. She's been along the ride with me all the way too. Ah, so that was a very successful reason going there, eh? <laughs> exactly, yeah. I got two for one that, that trip. I got the rugby and the, and the, and the wife. So. Good stuff. Okay, so great. So tell us what happened after that, uh, Scott. Where did you go next on your journey? Um, well, so I spent five years at the Kings. I sort of um, first went through the academy and then when I was 20... Um, got opportunity to play for the main side at the time in what we called the Vodacom Cup back then. Um, and then sort of just loved my time. They kicked on. We got a year in Super Rugby 2012-2013, which was massive. Sort of the people of Port Elizabeth loved it. We had big crowds every week. And unfortunately, the way it worked then, we had to play the Lions at the end of the year in a promotion relegation game, home and away. Um, we lost the home game by seven points, won the away game by five points. So we ended up missing out staying in Super Rugby by two points, which sort of semi half killed the union at the time. And we sort of had a rebuild then for another couple of years. And then um, what happened then, we were sort of in our year, the year before going into Super Rugby again. And throughout the year, there was sort of a few funny couple of months, like a month we'd get paid two days late and the next month would be fine. And the next month was a week late. Then we had a stage where we didn't get paid for a month, but then the end of that month, we got triple pay because they said that was our way of showing we've got lots of money, we'll be fine. Then the next month was our last sort of in-season payday month. We had a Wednesday. Um, Wednesday was payday. And they, what they did is they paid the 23 of us that were playing on the weekend so that we couldn't sort of, because we had spoken about as a team stuff, do we strike or do we do something to say like, this isn't good enough. But because they paid the 23, we actually had no choice. So. What we did, I remember quite vividly, we were playing the Bulls away and we ended up playing with, we wore white armbands as a way to be like, this is just showing that we're sort of standing with our teammates who haven't been paid yet, like it's not good enough. Um, big uproar the next week when we got back, the president's not happy and this and that, and, like, and it's a bit crazy to think they thought we would just be okay with what was going on. Um, season finished like two weeks later, went off, had our like normal five-week um, off-season and then... It got to, we were starting, I think, Thursday. It was about the 8th or 9th of November or something. And November came, obviously, we hadn't been paid. It got to, like, the Monday before, and they said, listen, there's been a few technical issues. You guys will be paid this week. We'll start preseason the Monday after. And then the Friday would come, and they'd say, oh, it's not going to be the Monday. It's going to be the Thursday we'll start. And this went on for six weeks, basically. Eventually, we got to a point where Saru had to step in because we weren't doing any preseason. We didn't really have a squad going into Super Rugby. Now it was just complete chaos. <coughs> and then I think it was like the 16th of December or 18th of December. Or something. I remember there was um, talk of how Saru were coming in, had this list of players that were going to call on the day and say, listen, you've got a contract for next year. Um, they dissolved the old company that had all of our contracts and deals in. So sort of everyone who was there lost their, lost their deal. And then I sort of, because I'd been there five, six years and I knew like people who knew a lot of the right people out there at the time. And I was sort of led to believe I was completely fine. So I sort of was really relaxed going into the day, like normal day, like just sort of expecting the phone call to come. And then 
sort of nine o'clock becomes 10 o'clock becomes 11. You get a message from this friend saying they've got an email from the players union saying, because that's all it was. All you got was an email saying your services are no longer required. Or you got the phone call from the CEO saying, yeah, you've got a contract. Um, come in and sign. We start, you start in a week or two weeks time. And then, so 11 to 12 to 1, and sort of that went on and on. And then you got notice of like a few sort of bigger players not getting deals. And I could all became a bit like, hang on, like what's actually going on? Um, about 5 o'clock, I contacted my agent being like, do you know what's going on? He's like, as far as he knew, I was fine. Um, he just had to hop on a flight. As soon as he lands, you'll find out. Uh, me and my girlfriend, then we went out for pizza, like still nice and relaxed. And we sort of sitting in the pizza place, remember, and we're waiting. And then this is about, Hopper State and also I see my agent phoning me. I'm like, okay, what's going on? And he was like, listen, he doesn't, doesn't know what happened. Like this morning I was fine. This evening he's just landed, been told there's nothing now. And then, so I sort of got the weight. I was like, can we get some takeaway and go home? Obviously me and the wife quite um, devastated at the time. End up getting email at quarter to nine that night saying, sorry, your services are no longer required. So wow. obviously that was a huge shock, a bit like a complete mess, like a bit of a disgrace, all those sort of things mm. you you go through um, and then sort of picked other pieces for a couple of weeks. And then funnily enough, it came, it was like the first week of January. And then I heard that they sort of all of a sudden started to phone one or two other guys who didn't get deals to offer them and come back again. And um, I remember I had a phone call from our doctor then, nice, super nice guy. I was like, this is random. So I picked up the phone and then I don't know if he thought I would answer because it was him because spoke for about a minute and he was like, oh, the CEO wants to talk to you. And then, the guy sort of tried to say, listen, um, the made a mistake or dinner, we got some more funds. We wanted you to stay. Do you want to come stay? And I was sort of like, I want to tell him politely there's no chance. But instead I said, oh, don't know. Let me just chat to my agent. I'll get him to speak to you. And I just called my agent, told him like, I can't sort of, I wasn't willing to, the way they went about things and sort of, in my opinion, what their like values and the, like the ethics of the team just wasn't right for me to, to play. And like a bunch of my closest friends at the time, all got told no back when I did. And now they hadn't been asked to come back either. So I was sort of like, you can't just have one or two of us. Now you take all of us, you take none of us. And so that was like, a, in hindsight, like big decision for me to, to say no, because other people who then took the opportunities after got better opportunities thereafter. And it's sort of, because the year in Super Rugby where you can make your name just like that. Mm. Um, someone like Lucanio, like you look back and someone like Lucanio, um, sort of like World Rugby Player of the Year, South African legend, he was one of the people to benefit sort of from us falling apart at the time. So obviously there are those things which came from it, which is, which is mega, but yep. just at the time sort of wasn't what that team wasn't for me. And then, so I just <clears throat> put that aside. Like kept, I was living, so my parents had moved to the Eastern Cape at that time. My wife's family lived there. So sort of, we'd stayed back home and just, I just kept training, trucking along. And then um, one of my close friends there went, went out to Western province because he knew John Dobson really well. Um, and then played a game and I was talking to him after his debut and he sort of messaged me and I was like, I'll tell Dobbo I'll come if he wants me to come. And then like half joking, and he's like, are you serious? I was like, well, I'm a little bit serious, but like, so 10 minutes later, I had Dobbo on the phone and he sort of, his passing comment was like, unless you become a really shit rugby player in the last three months, we'd love to have you. I was like, Dobbo, I'll pack up my bag. I'll see you tomorrow. And he's like, take your time. Like we had to buy the next week. So I sort of packed up my bags on a Sunday, Monday, I drove down to Cape Town. We had like a Tuesday training session. Thursday, we're out in Camps Bay, funnily enough. We trained yeah, there. Right. And then had one of the big, the big customary team socials. Where we went and stayed in this, um, we all stayed in the backpackers in town and had sort of a big team building event, which was, and I was like, which was big fun. And then, so the next week, um, we were playing the cheaters. Dobbo came on the Monday because the Flauf got called up to the storm and stuff. And he was like, I need you to play Flauf this week. And I had played sort of, one half of Flauf in my life at that point. <laughs> and I was like, listen, Dobbo, see what I can do. And he's like, no, no, you'll be fine. And sort of, I guess the way with like Dobbo, Darby, Norman, like this, it's all the coaching staff who with the Stormers now. And the reason why they're so good, they just give you that belief that you can go out and sort of do anything. And then you want to do it for them at the same time. And sort of that one thing led to another. And sort of two, three months later, um, Flecky was the, the Stormers coach at the time, sort of, called me up and said, listen, they had, I think Cheslin and John de Jong were going to the seven. So they were a little bit thin squad player wise to going to, to the Stormers and going to Australia for the Super Rugby tour. Cause it was those short tours in that season. Yeah. And next thing I was on the plane to Australia, going to play for the Stormers, which is obviously my boyhood team that I watched from every week. Me and my dad would go from when I was seven to when I finished school at 18. So it was a yeah. bit of a crazy 
yeah. crazy six months. I'd gone from being let go to now all of a sudden I'm, <clears throat> I'm playing for the Stormers. And then funnily enough, we ended up, played the two games, made my debut against the um, four South and Perth. Then we played the Rebels. And then we played, we happened to play the Kings back at Newlands for my Stormers, de- like Stormers home debut. Yeah. And we sorted them out quite nicely. So it was quite a full circle where I've gone from being let go by this team, going back to sort of my hometown team and then playing them playing them that night and then end up going to Skulk Burgess Farewell that <laughs> evening. It was, it was a bit of a, a crazy six months, but it's given me like this sort of, it's luckily enough given me such good perspective going through anything I go through now in life is when I know as bad as things get, there's something really good coming around the corner. So if you just hang in there and sort of yeah. tough it out and keep sort of stick to your process, the good things come after that. Yeah. What an incredible journey and and what uh, a great insight to what it's like to be a professional sports person, right? Because a lot of people think it's, uh, you know, all champagne and uh, and dancing all the time, right? But uh, as you've just explained to us, there's a lot of highs and a lot of lows and uh, it helps you build resilience. And that's what you're talking about, right? You, you just really were able to get uh, resilient and look at the world in a different way, I guess. And uh, what was it like going to Australia first time, playing rugby over there? What, 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 what cultural differences did you see? But also, what did you see on the rugby field in terms of the differences between South African rugby and Australian rugby at that time? Um, I, suppose I was probably very lucky. The Stormers were such a good team at the time. Like, I mean, you go through the forward pack and it was people like Malhaba, Kitsoff, Dwayne, Skaltberger, Sia Khaleesi, like you... Yeah, Etzebeth, you got pretty much guys who just won the World Cup back to back now. So we went there. I remember the force was just um, hammered down that night. It was messy night. It was just sort of up front forwards game. The Rebels was a bit dry, and sort of once you could break them down, you could then overpower them the last 30 minutes and come away with a good win in both games. And um, I think at the time it was just too much power and a bit too much quality around that Stormers side to to play like the. And it was a force and Rebels so at the time we were always a little bit up and down. Um, but then it was just two really good wins and to see, I think you could just kind of see the the difference in quality of a team like the Stormers against maybe not the strongest Australian teams at the time. Yeah, yeah, right. So for a guy like yourself who was, you know, on his way through his career and you're rubbing shoulders literally with these uh, icons of South African right. rugby, what were some of the experiences you learned from those guys? What did, what did they teach you as a rugby player? I think... Uh, that's, that's a cool question. Um, probably the, you can see that how the different personalities interact with the one another and how the different sorts of leaders lead in their own unique ways. You had someone like Skulk, just the friendliest, nicest man in the world, but you put him on the rugby pitch and he's ruthless. There's no sort of backing down to anything. You have someone like Dwayne, who just leads by example. Sia, the nicest guy in the world again, who'll just go around doing his job, putting it in. You have all those different pieces of the puzzle and sort of learning how they interact with one another, sort of how they interacted with the coaches. You could see like when things were down or when things needed to be said, they weren't afraid to sort of um, confront and, and bring up, be nice and honest with one another to make sure you get the best out of the team. And like even a couple of years before that, I was I had like a short loan thing at the Stormers and there was someone like Sean de Villiers as well who was loved to crack a joke and have a good time. But <clears> when <throat> things needed to get serious, it was just that ability to flip the switch yep. at any given moment, which is something like you can sort of, try and learn and try bring and some people can do it some people can't it's one of the hardest things i think you see the top top players who sort of can be super relaxed for one minute and two minutes later they'll be fully in the zone ready to go so that was quite a eye-opening thing and just to see the this probably the consistency and skill level um as you go up a level i found that's always been the biggest thing for me and not sort of these flashy big passes and big steps or this uh, just the uh, Probably you'd know as a Kiwi, like the, the basics done really, really well at a high speed every single time where there's just there's just no letting up. That's probably the, being the, the biggest thing I've seen, the top, top players for me. It's doing the basics so well all the time and then ridiculous on-field communication as well, which is something that's really hard to coach, I think. Mate, I would jokingly add to that list of things that need to be executed is getting conversions over and penalty kicks, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. So was there, was there one of those players in particular that stood out to you in terms of just exceptional leadership, execution of skills uh, on the field? Was there one in particular that stood out for you? Oh, um, probably either, like I would say, Jean or Skulk, probably other two. Skulk had the crazy skills for a forward as well and just 
always did the the basics so well regardless but then also could throw just do some sort of the hands of a of a sort of top five in the world center but then he's playing at six seven or eight is just crazy he was probably I think between John and Skulk you could see that just they were that whole whole another level in terms of the way they could play what they could do and just doing it over and over again and then lucky enough to play someone like Cheslin Colby who's just born with gifts that you can only dream of yeah 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 interesting um, okay, so you got back from Australia. You, you're in that Super Rugby zone, but then uh, an opportunity came up in the UK. So how did that come about? Yeah, so it's fun. I was actually talking to the coach here in Jersey around that Stormers time, and sort of at the time, I was like, "Listen, I think I'm going to be in the Stormers mix now. Obviously, I can't come. I want to sort of explore this and see how far I can go." Um, and then sort of put that on hold for a bit. And then even in the interim, there was a, a, chat, a little bit of a chat with the coach at Zebra, um, had sort of what I led to believe was a deal all signed and sealed and sorted. And then it fell through in the last minute. The coach said it was sort of a thing from high up. I found out it wasn't from high up. It was just obviously, I don't know, there was a bit of something went wrong in some way, um, which was obviously because of all, all I'd been to, it was a bit of a tough thing, but I was playing at Province anyway, playing for Dobbo in the Curry Cup, which was really good. Um, went away and then sort of over that December I spoke with the Jersey coach again we sort of said try to get over sooner but there was visa issues so we said okay let's do it for next season so I signed for the June of 2017 to go over and then ended up going back to province to play it was called a super sport challenge at the time mm -hmm. um, go play another sort of six or eight games for Dobbo there it's not easy to play match for <coughs> loads of fun yep. um, again and just just really enjoy myself and Sort of in amongst that time in, in the team I was with with Dobbo to really help because it was quite a young team and I had to sort of step up and be more of a leader in the group um, and Dobbo was always one uh, to sort of push that on you and really like get guys to become more open and more confident and that sort of really put me in good stead when I came over to Jersey because I sort of came with a lot more confidence than I think I'd had in sort of a year before that because of my time spent, spent on them which was really good. And yeah, then it was just a case of I always wanted to come overseas and experience a different culture and just see how things are. And Jersey was the first sort of stepping stone at the time. The way I viewed it was my, get in my foot in the door, play as well as you can and try and try and get into the premiership on the back of that. So what were uh, a couple of the biggest um, noticeable challenges coming to live on an island off the coast of France? And uh, not only playing rugby there, but living there as well. What were some of the things that... Uh, you can early remember about those early days in Jersey. Um, obviously, a lot smaller, so was like which I quite enjoyed because I'd gone sort of to PE, which was like mini Cape Town. Quite enjoyed that chilled by back to Cape Town, like big Cape Town. You're driving 40 minutes to an hour to get around anywhere. You come to Jersey, and it was 10 minutes anywhere across the island, which was quite cool to be honest. And um, really nice beaches, so at that uh, nice summer at the time. So it was quite a nice, easy way to settle in. Obviously, you just had to get used to spending in pounds and seeing how your money disappears a lot quicker than it did back home. <laughs> um, but that was probably, and we just like, <coughs> the people here were so welcoming. We had, weirdly, the, the time when I came, I think out of a squad of 32 or 33, there was something like 19, 20 new boys. So we had a completely new squad, mm -hmm. which almost made it easier to settle because everyone was new. So everyone had to get to know each other and sort of put that extra effort in to, to come together as a team. So from that side of things, it was really good. Obviously, then it's the, thing, the side of getting used to a different style of play, like especially the way Province and the Stormers has been a lot about ball in hand, sort of free to attack from anywhere, whereas you come to the UK and you've got to be much more pragmatic and smarter because it might look good from sort of September, October, but then once November comes and the weather kicks in, you can't do all those flashy things anymore. And you've got to make sure you've got really good set piece, really good defensive structures, kicking game, uh, and then you can build around that and sort of develop your team as you go. So, mate, are you blaming the English style of rugby on the weather? Part of it, I mean, part of it is sort of you've got to do it like but I guess then you should be really good at it like what South Africans are good at. You should be able to do that at, the, at that standard because this is sort of what they've been doing their whole lives, if that makes sense. I was going to say, you better get down to the bottom of the South Island in New Zealand and see how they do running rugby down there in the, <laughs> the middle of winter, yeah? So, um, oh, okay. They'll still throw it around. Though, <laughs> they'll still throw it around, yeah, that's for sure. So uh, what about the quality of rugby on the field in Jersey when you got playing? Was uh, How did it compare to um, South Africa? 
Um, different, it was physical. That's probably one of the big, I found that like, especially, obviously Storm is why Super Rugby, that's sort of physical, fast, different level. But then you compare sort of Curry Cup and the Super Sports Challenge stuff to the champ. So obviously you think like people, some people who've played in the champ know how hard it is and like it's a tough physical league with loads of good players. Other people sort of, who don't know it, speak of it like it's just this level below the prem and it's not sort of spoken about. But I found it like super physical straight away. Maybe not as quick, but I think that was just a, at the time, especially back then, it's got a lot better up until sort of this past season. All the teams have developed so much more. But at that time, just the speed I found was different. So you could you had that half a second extra on the ball, um, little things like that. But then physically, it was as if not more physical than sort of what I'd been used to. So that was fine, like a easier thing to adjust to, I think, because obviously South African rugby is quite physical most of the time. So being as physical or a tiny bit more wasn't, as a back especially, it wasn't something to to really worry about too much. It was more the, probably the speed. You had just had that half a second more on the ball each time and things. And we were lucky we had a super good forward pack, which obviously is like a backline stream. Yeah. So how did you go in the first season in Jersey? We did all right. We finished tied fourth at the time and then they had just taken away the playoffs, which would have been interesting because we would have had Bristol home and away. And we had just lost to them at home, but we beat them at Ashton Gate that year. So oh, it would okay. have been, I don't think they would have enjoyed it too much because we had a really good forward pack and their forwards weren't sort of that hot either. So it would have been a, a proper proper shootout. But sort of at the time, it was Jersey's best finish, which was really nice for us. Yeah. Um, and we sort of, and it was on the back of, we really struggled early on in the season, I guess. New team, finding our feet. We sort of won a couple, lost three or four, five on the bounce before coming together around December time. And then we, from December through the end of the season, I think we lost two or three games all year. We sort of properly turned it around and found a really good balance of forward and backs. Um, had a crazy good mall. I think our top two try scorers, embarrassingly enough, were our starting hooker and our reserve hooker. So uh, luckily we rectified that by the, the last year I was here now. So. Oh, good stuff. And how did, the, uh, how did the good lady settle into life in Jersey? Did she enjoy it when you first arrived there? Yeah, she did. Luckily, she went, um, got a job at like a school nursery just around the corner from us, and she made some really nice friends pretty quickly. And then her um, twin sister came over for like a few months, would work in like this poker place around the corner, um, and they sort of loved it. That's a good, like really good fun night out in Jersey, so they could crack on and do that. There are a few of the players' girlfriends as well, so she she really enjoyed it from that side of things too. Yeah, that's really important. makes it super easy for me. That's really important, isn't it? You know, when you move as a player to anywhere in the world, if your other half can have an easy time of transition, it makes a difference as well, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, completely. And she she had the Irish passport, so I got my visa on the back of her passport, so it needed to be nice for her, otherwise I was going back. To <laughs> <laughs> oh, good on you. So you were there at Jersey, and then uh, it wasn't long, and you got an opportunity to go elsewhere in UK rugby. How did that come about, and what was it? Yeah, I was quite sort of fortunate at the time. I had um, Alan Solomon, who was my coach, who gave my debut at the Kings, um, my Super Rugby debut at the Southern Kings. He got a job at um, the Worcester Warriors. He took over sort of end of December 2017 and January 2018. He called and said, listen, you'd love to have me over there. And sort of, I was just said, snapped his hand off. I was like, yes, please. That was sort of the dream coming to Jersey was to make that next step to get up into into the Prem. And then that was a sort of a, a nice sort of segue in thinking like, you know, it made it much easier to adjust knowing you're going to a coach you've played for before and it just made it much easier to settle for that next move. Yeah. So uh, so you went over there and you went to the mainland, of course, and uh, how was how was life different over there than being on the island of Jersey? Oh, yeah, so straight to Worcester, which is an all right place. There's some nice spots, some not such nice spots. Um, but <laughs> yeah. it's sort of, I guess, once you leave Jersey, then you realise quickly how how nice Jersey actually is to be honest. That was probably one of the biggest takeaways. Like there's all of a sudden there's no beaches anymore. Like there's no five minutes all around. Even though luckily Worcester was small enough, so there's only 20 minutes drive to the ground, things like that. But just to that, like the small things, you sort of forgot how nice. Quickly realized Jeepers, we had it good in Jersey. But then we had shops like Aldi and Little in the UK. So all of a sudden my pounds actually could take me and buy me some food for once and stuff. So that was, <laughs> that was good. And, so I enjoyed, it was a nice place, Worcester, and it was lucky in terms of the time I was there, the nicest bunch of boys ever, like some really good mates I made at my time then. So sort of, I held the place together in terms of, because we didn't really get the results we wanted for a long time there, but 
the boys sort of stuck tight and because we were such a close knit bunch of guys, we sort of enjoyed ourselves day in, day out. Yeah. Good. So tell me, with your time uh, both in Jersey and then Worcester, how was your personal uh, rugby level going in terms of, did you feel that you were growing in the game and learning new new skills from these people, these new people that you were, A, being coached by, and secondly, the group of players that you were around? Yeah, so Jersey was sort of a big, I guess, development from, I was lucky enough to be like named captain, so it helped me sort of develop leadership side of things and um, really like take the onus on myself a lot because small coach we had just had sort of Harvey our head coach and then a forwards coach and it was sort of that sort of tiny coaching staff so you've got to really take it upon yourself to to get things done a lot of the time then you've got a team like Worcester where it's sort of back to that old forwards back skills coach kicking all these things and um, learn from a lot of good players so people like Chris Pennell had been around the block um, Ashley Beck one of my close mates who played at Worcester like you had like Duncan Ware who's played for Scotland and sort of all these these big names you could then see again and understand why they got to the level they did because of the little things they do all the time. Um, someone like Bryce Heem obviously was there. He was a freak, to be honest. Like, <coughs> so good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, unfortunately, just sort of, especially my first year at Worcester, I first hurt, first preseason game, like 20 minutes in, got like crushed under a tackle and sort of hurt the nerve in my shoulder, which took four and a half months to come right, which was a really weird one because it felt like the old school stinger. Um, and then on the field, it sort of didn't get better and was like, okay, it was just a long-term get off. And then sort of took weeks and weeks and weeks of just like plugging away at rehab and would get sort of, I would say 5% better from literally probably 10% strength. It took 5% a week for the next sort of 15 weeks to get me, get me back to normal. Like there was a case where when I started, I'd put my arm out and our physio could take his finger and just sort of push my arm down. And there was nothing I could do. It was really weird one luckily I got back from that and then a couple of months later in the A-League semi-final got cleaned out and did my AC joint so I had to have an operation on that so that first year was sort of a tough one and then sort of built on the second year got better like got a bit um, a couple more opportunities things started going well and then as the next season was coming COVID hit and that sort of threw up a whole different set of challenges again um, so it was a Really enjoyed it, like such a good bunch of boys. Like I wouldn't change it for anything, to be honest. Even though rugby-wise may not have been the thing, I could have stayed in Jersey another year maybe and played a full year of rugby, not got injured, those things. But then, but once again, those things you learn from, it was my first sort of two serious injuries that had come in the same season. So I learned how to deal with that. Um, so sort of living in a different place again and then just um, to being with a good bunch of boys sort of really helped get me through those times and sort of see me through all those different challenges and sort of by the time COVID thing came, my wife was pregnant with our first little boy. So that sort of all the bad stuff that might've been happening on the side was sort of far, so far back in my mind because obviously we were so excited for what was to come. I'm glad you talked about the injury because it's part of professional sport. And uh, a lot of people watching the show today probably wouldn't understand the, the mental aspect of going through an injury like that and uh, having a couple of injuries as you did. Could you maybe just talk around that a little bit in terms of how you dealt with it from a mental well-being? You know, mental health is a huge thing in rugby today, and we we talk about it a lot. But uh, how did you actually cope with that long-term injury? Did you have any specific tools or training or skills that you were supported with? Um, yeah, it was a tough, probably a tough one. I hadn't really thought about even until now as much as sort of because I I was quite so so lucky back home. I think I missed over my whole career back in South Africa, maybe two games in different, like a one game miss and a one game miss from little niggle. So it was never an issue at Jersey. I had two sort of four or five week injuries, which weren't so weren't that bad. So it was easy enough to get through. The Worcester one was the first real tough one, especially the nerve thing. Cause it was sort of, as they spoke, it was like, we would literally go weak. It wasn't like, I, if I knew at the start, okay, you're going to be back in four and a half months. You're like, okay, now I can prepare myself. Like when I when I had my AC joint injury, it was much easier to sort of put a plan in place. And then from that, I knew I could tick off. I'm quite like disciplined, hardworking, and like a bit of structure. So once I could put that structure in place, I just knew I'd just keep chipping away. And you get those little wins every day where it's, geez, this, this rehab thing feels so much better today. And then in a week's time, you're lifting five kgs more on this lift. And you're like, sweet, that's another tick. That's a tick. And I always like to sort of dock you. I've got like a bunch of little books back home where it's, day by day I'm sort of ticking off all the little things I'm doing I've got a, my gym sessions written down so I could see my progress and 
have those little wins all the time. The, the, the nerve one was probably the toughest because, like I said, it was completely week by week because we sort of, the physios were like, you could wake up tomorrow, lift your arm and be like, I'm fine. And then you've, you're sort of ready to go. But because we didn't know when that day would be and it ended up just being a slow process of work really hard and we ended up finding a, the best method was sort of go really hard for two days, take two days completely off and then go hard for two days, take two days off instead of a conventional plug away each day because we did that for the first month and the gains just weren't, it wasn't worth it. So we're like, okay, well, let's see if we really push it, then really rest it, then really, and then that sort of got the ball rolling and slowly we were able to build some momentum and get through that. But, um, big, obviously I had my wife there, so that was fine. Like we had, um, we got two cats as well, so they would keep me going at home. And then the boys at Worcester were so good. So making sure you're out for coffee, spending time with your teammates, things like that keep you involved as much as you can. Because I think that's, even when I had a couple of injuries in these last couple of years at Jersey, it's when you get that, you feel like you're a bit disconnected from the team. I find this is probably the hardest thing. You sort of lose the value you, you would bring to a team if the, the sort of the coaches and the people aren't managing you correctly. That you, you lose that sense of value, which I've always found is the hardest part of, of being injured, is you, you lose the value you think you bring. So all of a sudden, you maybe start questioning, like, what what am I doing here? What value am I bringing? And that's when the sort of doubts creep in. But that's where I, I like to keep that structure so I could keep ticking off the things I could control. And then slowly, once you see the little wins adding up and the time to return fading away, then you sort of, once you get past that first two, three months, and then you know you're only a month or two away and you're flying and you can really get your head down and go again. Yeah, so it's definitely finding that balance between sticking close to your mates, trying to be involved as much as you can <clears> while... Also, just looking after yourself at the same time. And having a routine, as you said, because having that routine keeps you uh, focused and, and motivated as well, yeah? Yeah, completely. Even now, I've found in this last sort of five, six weeks, I'm sure we'll touch on it just now, when everything has happened in Jersey, it's the first couple of weeks, there's just no routine, and you're like, geez, this is weird. It's not sort of, don't like it, to be honest. And then you develop some sort of little routine and get things going, and it makes it just helps you get those small wins all the time, keeps your headspace in a good place and allows you to, to build some momentum and get things, get things going again, which is just so important. Yeah, it's a really interesting sharing because rugby, like a lot of sports, you're in that professional bubble, aren't you? You're living a life in a bubble, really, because you, you've got that routine set out. You've got your, your program and you've got your games in the weekend and your whole life is built around that schedule. And uh, I imagine that once that's gone or interrupted in any kind of way, it just uh, brings a whole different uh, philosophy to it. What would you say to someone who's watching this today, Scott, who's um, struggling with an injury and uh, on the sidelines at the moment and they're getting a bit depressed about it all? What, what advice would you throw their way? Um, I'd sort of say the two big things would get, say, get, get like a really good routine and structure. So try and as much as you can, depending on your setup and your physios and things, try and build some sort of plan. So I knew as new, say at week six, I'd be running and week five was this week four, week three. So I had little goals to sort of tick off as I go and then plan your weeks. So sort of um, get your, get your week structure built up. So then you can tick off those little wins all the time. And then something we haven't quite touched on yet is I was lucky enough to study bits and pieces as I went through. And I found luckily enough in the times when I was injured, I had, something off the field to keep me going. So just do something, whether you want to, it's a hobby or it's reading a couple of books or find something you're really interested in. And then, so if you get to use all this free time, which you actually, like you take for granted at the time thinking, oh, it's so terrible, I've injured, I can't play, but you've got free weekends now, you've got a free extra hours every now and then. So find something away from the game that, that can stimulate you just to, to sort of broaden your horizons. And it often helps you give different perspectives on, on what you're currently going through at the same time. Thanks for the perfect segue. Let's talk about your education journey because that was something that's been uh, relevant to your life journey. Now, was that a conscious decision when you became a, a rugby player? Did you want to have that other option available and continue that as well? Yeah, I think I'd always sort of, I, the idea was that it was to do some sort of education. And luckily, my dad was quite, quite big on making sure I studied because he started studying when he was out of school. And then obviously back in the day, you're off to the army. So he did like a year, it didn't go that well. And then it was like, Oh, do I stick it out to just head to the army? And he went to the army and then found it a lot harder to then build himself up after that. Um, so he was always said, no matter what you do, make sure you study. And we were quite lucky at the Kings at the time. They had a deal with Nelson Mandela University where 
you because the academy was based there you got to study for free at the same time or we got it for free i think obviously they had some sort of deal but so it was sort of a no-brainer for me and then it was just a case of um the first year wasn't too bad because i'd done those subjects at kingswood my first year i could do my full first year and a couple of subjects on my second year just to always stay ahead because the first year was just in the academy where it's sort of train early in the morning and late afternoon so you had a full university sort of schedule going at the same time which was fine second year then was quite tough because I went more full time so then it was sort of off days were fully taken on studies I would have to go to some evening classes sort of we played Friday nights a lot of the time at the Kings so I'd been university from eight till one on a Friday on game day which now I think it's crazy but at the time <laughs> it was so normal for me so yeah um, luckily I did that, stuck it out. So by the time my third year came, which is obviously the, your toughest year, I only had sort of four or five subjects to complete, which allowed me to sort of keep that balance and making sure I, I ended up finishing my degree in those three years, which was really, really quite good. And um, once it was done, I was super, like, really happy that I got it done and saw how much it was worth it. Because I think at the time, guys, sort of, lots of guys took it for granted. I think there's only one other guy who was with me in the academy through that time who's still trying to finish his degree now. Um, but that sort of guys just took it a lot for granted. And now because of what I'm going through at the moment, I'm so happy I got that done. And then because of that, I was always aware again, I want to just keep, keep learning around things I'm interested in. So <coughs> six months later, I did a, another certificate in project management, which I quite enjoyed. I did one in commercial property just because a friend had said, a good market to know a little bit about so i just did that for because i had sort of connections with this company that was doing it and then when i came to worcester i was looking again to sort of study um just to do something more and i found um a, diplo a postgraduate diploma in sport management through the johan cruyff institute they linked to the sort of barcelona university and that's all literally like johan cruyff set it up to help because he always was a big believer on sort of footballers educating themselves outside of the game so there's mm -hmm. sort of a bunch of different sports diplomas masters you can do and then did that over oh, four year really enjoyed it and you could sort of upgrade it they called it you like a diploma and a master in sports management where you do a few more subjects you do like this big final like thesis project to finish so i ended up doing that and getting that done which is really cool and sort of um so it was in the areas i was interested in so it was it wasn't even like a a chore to do because I was learning things like the different way football clubs are run, the different types of ownerships. There was a course on esports. There was like a leadership course. You were doing things like even something like facilities management, where you've got to know like how gyms run and the smallest details to the size of the change rooms, to how many people can be in the certain areas at a certain time, where the machine should go. All these little minute details which you sort of take for granted, but then you're learning along the way all those the different pieces of the puzzle and how they fit in. Um, that was really good and like I said earlier I, was, I always found weird enough that I would I think my rugby wise even would be a slightly better when I had something off field that helped me switch away because otherwise I'd just go home and watch games over and watch sort of training back and over analyze things a little bit whereas when I had something to go back to and okay, I can't do I need to do some work now and just completely forget about it then I could sort of engage more when I was at rugby then mm. sort of trying to just do rugby 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 24-7 so it gave you balance in your life, but it also gave you skill sets to move on after rugby, but it also gave you something else outside of rugby to focus on, yeah? Yeah, exactly that. And then sort of, like they also enjoyed other sports, so sort of golf was quite a big hobby, especially back home because the weather's nice. Yep. A little bit in Worcester too, so I'll try and play as much as I can. Just having those things to take your mind off, off rugby a little bit, because I did, so I've always loved being rugby, rugby, rugby. But then once you do other things, it just helps bring that balance, which I think is so important because then you're not sort of, your whole identity is not tied to rugby. You've got all these different pieces of you. So if you have a bad game on the weekend, it's like, okay, well, it's just one part of Scott because I've also got to be like a husband and a dad and a part-time golfer and I'm also studying and I'm also doing this and I'm also a friend to these guys. So it's one part of 10 parts of you that might not be going good, but if the other nine are going well, you shouldn't really let the, the one piece sort of dampen everything else around you. So you've, been, you've spent a bit of time at Sun City playing with Ernie Els, have you? <laughs> not quite, I wish, yeah, but I went on a golf tour with my mates to Sun City once, which was lots of fun. That's a I'll beautiful that. spot, isn't it? Eh? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. The Gary Player and the Lost City are so nice, man. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we got up to Worcester with your rugby and then um, Jersey came back on the radar again. How did that happen? 
So, so the funny, me and the coach always got on quite well. So every time I'd message to say like how the boys doing, like how the team would sort of, and then he would always be on, oh, your contract's on the table when you want to come back. So I'd sort of be like, okay, ha, good one, like laugh it <laughs> off. And then sort of it got to around COVID time and things weren't going at Worcester as well as I'd hoped they would go on. I sort of wasn't playing as much. Things weren't so sort of, me and my wife had always earmarked jerseys, one of the places where if we could come back and settle down, you know, we loved it. It was a case of, okay, well, let's, let's do it. And then finally it was, um, we had uh, like Messi, I think it was in like the February or March or something. And it was like, yeah, okay, well, let's, let's sort of do this thing for next season. And then luckily it just so happened that because it was the COVID time and I wasn't really playing for Worcester at the time, we managed to organize like a, a loan. I went and played one game, came back to Worcester. And then um, he sort of spoke to our coach again and said, oh, do you want to go on loan for the rest of the season? And because I sort of said to Worcester, I didn't want to stay. They knew, they, I don't think they wanted me to stay at the time either. It was sort of a nice mutual thing. They said, well, yeah, you can go on loan there for the rest of the season and then obviously stay, so it's easier. Um, then it was just a bit of chaos because I went from, in the space of, geez, four days, we had to pack up our two-bedroom flat into a bunch of boxes, get everything ready, get the flat clean and just disappear off on the ferry on a Monday morning and off to Jersey we came. So that was an absolutely chaotic time. Obviously, with just coming out of COVID and things, there were still small restrictions on many people. So like our goodbyes were a case of like, two people at a time, like a friend and his wife could come. So we could see them say goodbye to them. And the next one could come. And like, we had our you know, little boy then, he was sort of nine months at the time. So we had him as well. Two cats was just complete and utter mayhem, to be honest. And thankfully we managed to, I think because it was so quick and so hectic, we just found a way to get it done. And then next thing we were in Jersey and sort of straight away, I remember the first day I walked back in here and sort of a few of the familiar faces was here before. You get that sort of feeling like, oh, I feel like I'm at home. It feels really good to be back. And then just managed to settle in straight away. My wife sort of went back to her old job she was at before, phoned them up and said, I'm back. They said, please come work whenever you're ready to start. And that was sort of, we knew we had made the right decision then and could probably settle down now and, and make this place a home for, for the foreseeable future at least. Yeah, fantastic. So you're back on the island. Life got back into some sort of resemblance of normal again. But... Uh, the journey didn't turn out as you expected. What happened uh, after that? It was, I suppose it was at the time when he first came, it was sort of weird. The team was building, building quite nicely. We sort of um, finished the COVID, like struggled a little bit the COVID season, finished strongly, came the next year and then got like a quite, quite a good squad together. Um, had a good season, came second. We sort of slipped up once or twice at key times of around Christmas, which sort of cost us, cost us pushing more. But then, um, signed well again and sort of had the this, this strongest squad jerseys ever had by far. We had a really good squad and um, it allowed us to chop and change throughout that, that the last season and we, obviously that ended up with us winning winning the championship which was massive because we don't have the ground and there's a bunch of those silly RFU rules. Um, we couldn't go up and then unfortunately somehow between things five months later the club we got called and we were off to Cornish Pirates on a playing Friday night, we got called Thursday um, morning, we meant to fly at half nine, we got a message <clears> at six in the morning saying, can you meet at the club? The chairman needs to talk to you. And then it was a case of, they had a meeting yesterday with whoever the other investors were, they pulled out and in the afternoon that them and the board decided to cease trading and that was that done and dusted sort of. Um, and it was just a complete shock. We'd had a sort of, um, the month before, we had some weird payment thing where they said there was a bank holiday, so they put the money in too late. So we were paid sort of instead of the morning of payday, we had to send our um, like sort of admin player welfare la a manager up at the club, send her down to the bank and pass one by one. But then because we were all, they could send her to the bank, pass one by one. You're thinking like okay, there can't actually be issues. Um, chairman came in two weeks later, said not to worry, finance is all in order. Sort of the year preceding that, we'd always been told we had five or six investors. So if one pulls out, we we find we won't be like Worcester, we won't be like London Irish. We told numerous times things like that, and then unfortunately it sort of got to a point, and within a day they decided that's that and pulled the plug. And sort of was a massive shock to everyone. Sort of hurt a bunch of people, and it was tough to tough to take because we had built something so special here for it to be sort of pulled in what out when in our eyes looked like in a sort of afternoon of chaos, they pulled the plug because I guess they, in their eyes, they didn't have any choice. And then since then, 
bits and pieces have come out like we've only got we've got three million pounds worth of debt five hundred thousand of which is a tax bill there's only a hundred thousand pounds worth of assets in this company that's been liquidated because thankfully the <coughs> the sort of company was split into a few different parts and the amateur leg had the grounds and the clubhouse and those sorts of things because if that had all been in this club's name and they had gone bust this rugby on the island could have been dead like properly gone so thankfully that that side of things was saved which has sort of allowed us to the rugby club to keep going and that's sort of who i've been playing with for the last couple of weeks and had loads of fun doing so at the same time so a couple of things i want to unravel from all of this for people that are watching outside of the uk who don't understand the uk rugby system just talk to us more about when you won the actual competition and you weren't able to go up what are the reasons behind that why weren't your club able to go up in competitions yeah so i think there's a few things so I know you have to sort of apply from the December or January before you've got to put forward this application to the RFU and include things like your ground's got to be a minimum of 10,000. I think now the rules are something like 5,000 for a year with clear plans to be seven and a half by year one, 10,000 by year two, something along those lines. Um, then there's also something around the P share where you have to, I think, put in like five, 10, 15 million or something to get your like share in the premiership to then have your team in there and then there's TV rights and all that which come with that. Um, and then there's certain, like your owners have got to go through, I think a proper, well, whatever their proper test was, but obviously at Irish and Worcester, the test can't be super, super great because the owners, I, I know the, the Worcester owners from when they arrived didn't seem like all that and that sort of ended in, in the way it did. Um, I don't know how it was at Irish, but you know, so they have these all these, rules in place obviously the ground is the big one we sort of knew even if we won we couldn't go up they'd already said to Ealing they couldn't go up based on this ground um, somehow they, they I think Doncaster could just fit because they happened to two years ago they said Doncaster couldn't go up for whatever reasons and then because at the time they were coming second and they were quite close to, to winning the league and then last year they said oh no they qualified to come up now and it just happened that they were sitting in sixth place and about 30 points off us in Ealing. So it was like, well, it's real convenient to say you, you can come up this year if you manage to overall 30 points again. So it's like, yeah, it's just a, a crazy thing. And obviously, who knows if we had been allowed to go up based on sort of how it is in football, where if you win, you go up. And then I'm sure investors, people like that in a place like Jersey, you've got a team in the Prem, that sort of opposition you're going to be playing week in, week out. People would have, might have been willing to put more money in sort of. Yeah. And that sort of probably lent in once we weren't allowed. We didn't really know what the future of the championship looked like. There's been lots of talk of two teams of 10 trying to copy the French model. Um, the championship doesn't really have like their own TV rights. So it's never on TV. They would sort of stream one game a weekend if you're lucky. But then this season, there wasn't going to be any game streamed. So you've gone from 10 games to people could watch to none, which is also crazy in its own way. And just there was never any sort of building the like signs of that they're actually going to build the champ and try and build it into something big. It was always just look after themselves. Cause I know the funding went from pre COVID. I think championship teams would get three, four, 500,000 pounds a season to help them develop. And then naturally COVID came. So they cut from, I think it was 400 to 200. And then the year after COVID was a hundred. And then I think this past year when we won or something crazy, like 50,000 pounds, a champ team. But then obviously you're getting like, with the, like not having got obviously the, the, well, the English players, but they're getting paid 20, 25 grand a game. But then they can only give champ teams 50 grand a game, so 50 grand a year for the whole season. And uh, take a guess how much we got for winning the championship. Uh, no idea. I couldn't even guess. Zero. There Zero for winning the championship. Zero. Yeah. Zero. Nothing. Not a single... I think we got we got to parade the trophy around here with about six bodyguards because apparently the trophy was worth five or ten grand, but couldn't we, they didn't get jersey. So like, you add all those things up, and obviously from an outside business <coughs> perspective, you're looking at this, thinking this team's built this, won the champ, on the back of all they've had. They, like you just got to spend, spend, spend. You're not really getting anything back from the outside party. So that's obviously been a big reason as to why. And then sort of this season we had been funded by the government for like five months, thankfully because they sort of kept us going but it got to a point where they couldn't really justify this because when was the end and they couldn't we're obviously a private entity though 
we were taking money from a lot of other sports that could have benefited on the island, which obviously selfishly, like, thank you, thank you. But from their perspective, they can't justify doing this over and over and over again because it's not mm. fair on everyone else. Mm. And because it got to the point where eventually they had to say no. And then we had no money. And that was when they decided to pull the plug. So when did all this happen, Scott? This was sort of, what are we, six weeks ago? No, five and a half, six, I think it could be five weeks yesterday or six weeks yesterday. Right, it's okay. still quite fresh and obviously yep. tough. Um, but, and then at the same time, you sort of, I've been lucky that the Jersey people have been unbelievable, sort of reaching out and meeting. I've met so many nice people, been connected with a host of top people all around the island at different companies. So you sort of, I know you mentioned earlier, you, you, like rugby seems like this big, big bubble that you're in and it seems like such a big thing. But as soon as it's, you like put it to a side and you, you're out in the sort of big bad world, you would say, it's, you realize how much else is out there and how many opportunities are out there and what, how small the rugby world actually is in comparison to everything else. So that's been quite eye-opening. And I've had a few friends who sort of have, have mentioned this to me and I've been able to see it. And I've actually got a friend, funny enough, who, who lives in Mexico, in Mexico City. Um, and he sort of, his first comment was to me, um, he's actually the friend who got me to Western Province at the time, um, Timmy White, and he mentioned to me, it's like, oh, this could be your ticket out of there. And I was like, sort of, I was five hours into redundancy and what seemed like the end of the world and your good mates telling you it could be a ticket out of you. And I was like, that's actually quite a cool way of looking at the situation because exactly. maybe it is the, the sign that this is it. Like, obviously, I would have loved to play professionally for a few more years, but maybe it's time to to get out there and just throw myself into to <coughs> the big world and see see what comes from it. And I've really enjoyed sort of the people I've met. And now it's a case of trying to narrow those things down into concrete opportunities and then dive in and see what comes next. And then at the same time, I've been, I started playing for the rugby club here, which is obviously completely amateur and has been like a breath of fresh air playing with people who just want to do it for fun. You sort of, there's no coaches shouting at you. It's not your job to get up there every day. It's, it's my choice again. It's like I'm back at school just playing for fun, which has been really, really good. Yeah, just the just the uh, therapy you probably needed, right, at the time. No, exactly that. And it gives that, like, outlet. We still get that rugby fix, but it's just not that serious anymore. If things go wrong, it's not a big deal. And it also helps we've got quite a good team. So we, we sort of doing well in the league we're in at the moment, which is quite nice too. And there's a really good bunch of boys, which makes it even better, sort of. Now, I'm very surprised to hear that uh, Mr. Sweeney from the RFU hasn't got on the ferry and come over with a big check to help the uh, the Jersey Rugby Club. Anything from the RFU at all on this uh, debacle in Jersey? So all that really came, I think there was one, because obviously our chairman and thing, they released a statement, and part of their statement was there was no direction from the RFU, so, so they didn't know what was going on. And all the RFU could say in response was they knew what was going on, sort of, it's not their fault. And... <laughs> Then obviously there's been chat towards the government of Jersey and trying to say like they sort of implicit in this whole thing, but sort of from a player side, they're the last people we can blame because they bankrolled us for five months without us even knowing. So, um, but so it's, it's just been a lot of finger pointing that it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault, it's their fault. And no one's actually standing up and saying, listen, maybe we screwed up. Maybe it is. We didn't manage this as well as we could have. We could have spoken to this because even now I meet people and meeting sort of top MDs and top companies and things where they like, if they just come to us and ask for help, we maybe could have helped them. And all of a sudden you, you say to people, listen, we've got so-and-so from this top company helping us out. Are you willing to maybe help out? And then this guy's like, well, maybe I'll give them 50,000 pounds. And then his friend gives it. And all of a sudden you've got 10 companies just chipping in, gets us to the end of the season. And then you could restructure the whole jersey if you needed to go semi-pro or cut down on the budget or find a different way of doing things. But it was just, yeah, lots of finger pointing, obviously lots of hoping in the background that someone, some magic knight was going to come and save it and it would all be fine. But then obviously in the end, it, it sort of backfired spectacularly. So I was going to say that uh, Jersey is the home of some very high net worth individuals from across the world. And uh, we've seen uh, Hollywood actors come in to save football in the UK. None of them came over to Jersey and uh, wanted to help you out, Scott? Unfortunately not. No, maybe should have tweeted Ryan Reynolds to see if he maybe <laughs> wanted to buy a rugby team while he was at it because I'd tell him it would cost a whole lot less than it probably cost him at Wrexham. Wrexham, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, let's move on and uh, thank you for sharing your journey because it's been interesting to hear <coughs> your whole journey from, from South Africa to 
the UK. And, and what I'd like to ask you at this stage is if someone's watching this and they're a young rugby player, a boy or a girl, and they're starting off on their, their rugby journey, what piece of advice would you give to them based on your own experience as a, as a rugby player? Um, ooh. I would say it's, it's not as easy and fun as obviously it's made out to be. So make sure you're ready for a lot of hard work, a lot of sort of early mornings, late days and some, some hard work. But I promise it is, it is all worth it as well at the same time. Sort of what you get out of it is just as good. But I think be willing to put in a lot of hard work and then ask lots of questions and, and l try and get really good at listening to your coaches and the people around you because that's sort of the better you can listen and learn and learn fast, then you can get really good and go really far. But if you're not willing to, to open yourself up and listen and really um, dig in, then it's probably not going to be the sport for you. But I think hard work, being able to listen, communicate the massive skills that can get you just about as far as you want to go. Yeah, brilliant piece of advice there. Thanks for sharing that. Now, I wasn't going to have you on the show today without having the opportunity to talk to you about the Rugby World Cup. And uh, as a Kiwi talking to a South African, obviously this segment of the show is going to be very difficult for me. So please give me a little bit of uh, respite on this one. But uh, let's start off um, talking about pre-World Cup and uh, what your expectations were of the Springboks team going into this year's competition, knowing that there was going to be a lot of uh, competition from particularly Ireland, New Zealand um, at that stage, and France, of course, the ho host nation of this year's Rugby World Cup. What did you think about before the tournament? Did you think the Springboks had a chance of winning this year? I, to be honest, I definitely did. Sort of anyone I spoke to, even I think it was probably after the end of year tour last year, we went sort of just lost to Ireland, just lost to France, 14 men, but felt like we should have won both games and sort of thinking... We were still in a quite a good building stage then for the Springboks. You could see little bits and pieces of what Rusty and Jacques wanted to do. And with those two in charge, I just sort of, you feel so confident with what, what they got going on behind the scenes and you never question anything they do. So if they playing this completely different team, you'll be like, there's always a reason behind it. Like before the World Cup, we went to Twickenham with um, sort of not even, I think 60% of the guys end up winning a World Cup final. You had the rest of the squad. We've gone there and sort of done a job on a really good New Zealand team in Twickenham. And then you think they've always got a plan and going in. The toughest part was probably just because of the sides both of us were on in the pools. You knew you had tough pool games and then you had to get to a massive quarterfinal, which sort of set you up nicely in a way because you had gone through tough games. But then you go into a semi-final where you then completely expected to win, where all the pressure's on you completely. And then it was sort of, trying to get to the final. So you always knew it was going to be tough. And I guess I just always had faith that no matter what was thrown at us, I think because we had such a uh, sort of stringent game plan, everyone knew sort of what they had to do. They, they could have picked sort of another 20 different guys from back home, put them in the mix and told them what to do. And guys would just know what to do straight away. That was the beauty of the way we play, the beauty of how things work. It's just, um, they just all sort of training in the right direction, willing to give, give whatever they can for each other and so good at, I guess, like the non-negotiable side, like the work rate and work ethic and um, just non-stop. That side of things, they got to near perfect that the rest takes care of itself in the end and they did slowly develop the game. You had someone like Marnie come in and sort of light up the attack when we got going forward. So they slowly added bits and pieces, but over since we won that last World Cup and over the four years was just solidifying the, the non-negotiables, the things we really pride ourselves on. They got that so, so good that they could start adding little bits and pieces and develop the game so that teams knew they had to sort of stop old school South Africa. We're going to scrum you, we're going to maul you, we're going to be physical, we're going to kick really well. And then all of a sudden you had the side where, hang on, they've got a few players who can really attack now. So you've got to respect that at the same time while trying to figure out how to stop all the things they've been good at for sort of 20, 30, 40 years, sort of the whole history of South African rugby. So I sort of had always had real confidence, even after we lose to Ireland, you just think we probably shouldn't have lost that game. They did a few, they chose to do a few funny things like fast kicking from the halfway line, things like that. But then weirdly, somehow I just felt like Jacques and Rassi have a plan. We have the whole of South Africa, such complete faith that they'll find a way to get it done. And in the end, I think it was just that sheer confidence in what they do, being able to stick to the game plan meant that we could win three games in a row by one point, just because, they had such cl clarity on what they were doing every single game. 
Let's talk about the journey because you raised uh, the point of the Irish game and of course we saw that situation where South Africa could have won that game if Marnie had his kicking boots on that particular day. How did you particularly feel for Marnie in that situation where there was so much pressure on him and so many eyes looking at his goal kicking percentages? Um, how, how did you see that in, in terms of pressure on him? Oh, it's so tough. I think that, like I've been lucky enough to be a goal kicker um, at various teams and things, and I say lucky because I like the the idea of being the one in sort of control, so that if I miss and we lose, then I know it can go home and be like, okay, this is my fault. It's fine, even though that's not how teams look at it. That's not how anyone, but or sort of my own way of dealing with it. And I think people don't realize the pressure that's actually on him. I think you take an accountant and you put him. He's got to do his books in front of 50,000 other accountants watching him. We all think they know what's going on and screaming and shouting at him. It won't be as much fun for them anymore and they won't sort of give them a different perspective. So people don't understand the pressure and the sort of margins are so fine. You saw him like win URC games for the Stormers because his kicking was so good and then he's missed one or two in a World Cup and it's the end of the world again. So um, thankfully, I think the sort of the strength of the, the group and the culture the Springboks had meant that he could brush that off and just keep going anyway. And we knew sort of we needed him because he was sort of the hub of that back line at the time. Obviously, Andre came in and it was fantastic. But at the time, we needed Marnie to, to stay strong and stick it out. And obviously, he had a great game against Scotland a couple of weeks later. Um, but I think sort of people don't understand the, the, the pressure that you get. And that's on, I know from sort of the bits and pieces I've done, and that's on a whole new scale. So I can't even imagine sort of where you're thinking about every tiny little process all the way through. Um, but then he sort of managed to back it up and come back and bounce back, which is a credit to sort of his personality and his character at the same time. <clears throat> Look, I've got to tell you, I love the guy. I think he's a fantastic rugby player. And uh, looking beyond what he brings with his kicking boot, his, his uh, perception in the back line, his execution, his skills, the ability that he has to ignite that back line, and it doesn't matter who's playing outside him. He's got a really great connection with those outside backs and he can win a game for South Africa from any situation. I think by the time we get to 2027, I think he's going to be one of the superstars of world rugby. What do you think of that comment? No, exactly. I think obviously you as a Kiwi, you see that from a mile away. You have people like Richie Bowden, Damien McKenzie. I mean, those are the people you see week in, week out. And he can be the South African version. And obviously... He's sort of well-versed now in how the Springboks play and he's got all the keys to be able to to keep going forward. And I think this will give him loads of confidence. He's been there, done that, and he'll just keep getting better and better. And I know his kicking coach back at the Stormers, Gareth, he was actually with the guy, Gareth Wright. He got me to the Kings Academy back being my coach. And I know he's a fantastic kicking coach. He sort of helped turn Marnie's kicking career around, as I would say, in the last couple of years. And he's the reason he got up, got into the Springbok mix and then working together for another three, four years will no doubt make, I wouldn't be surprised if Marnie's in the top sort of four or five kickers come the next World Cup. And then if he's like that, South Africa will be right in the mix once again, which will be, to be exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's talk about the quarterfinal weekend because I think it must have been one of the greatest weekends of rugby that I can remember for a very, very long time. We had, of course, Wales and Argentina kicking us off on the first day. But then we had those amazing games between France and South Africa and we had the All Blacks against Ireland. What did you make of those two games particularly in that weekend? Oh, ridiculous. I mean, like you said, two of the best games you'll ever see, to be honest. Like, it was just, they're obviously worthy of semi-finals. You would have hoped that, like now, maybe World Rugby changed the draw so you don't have the sort of pulls we had like we did this year. But in essence, they were like the weird always joke amongst the people was those were the two semi finals. So whoever wins that gets to the final. And so it did work out that way. But yes, I guess it was cool seeing the, the contrast of like New Zealand, Ireland, which was such high skills. They're like sort of obviously how well the teams knew each other. You had obviously Joe Schmidt, who's now with the, the All Blacks, would have given them a trick or two. But just the high quality of skills probably epitomized by that last phase where the All Blacks have defended for, I think it was 36 phases before getting the turnover. It's just outrageous so you had like that side and then the Springbok France was just again high quality ferocious that first 20 minutes was like nothing anyone's ever seen before um, and then the end was just grinding it out again and Springbok's finding a way thanks to Big Ox coming on and turning the scrum around but like in that game you had Damien Willemse calling a mark and then opting for a scrum just before halftime which is in, like you'd never coach that in your life but the, that I think 
sort of epitomized the the belief they had in each other in that squad, which I think then gives them the confidence to go the rest of the tournament. And then obviously that going back to that New Zealand Island game was just high, high quality. And obviously you saw good New Zealand's defense grew throughout the tournament was also something I think gave them that the backbone because, you know, New Zealand is attacks sort of the best in the world. It's just how it is. It's always been. Yeah. Um, you know, just two unbelievable games. Did you think that uh, Ireland were going to score in that last phase of play? <sighs> I actually don't know. It's, it was just one of those where I couldn't speak. It was just quiet, <laughs> edge of my seat, wondering what's going to happen, who's going to make the mistake. It was one of those, like, if I was maybe South Africa attacking you, squeeze, like, fully in, like, please score. But I guess I was on the side where edge of my seat but I could really enjoy it even though the heart rate's racing like what's going to happen next and it was just enjoying will New Zealand cr crack or will Ireland make the first mistake and obviously luckily for you guys you got they cracked first but it was just pure enjoyment seeing a team sort of two teams and like I wouldn't say New Zealand I'd say New Zealand at like the peak of their defensive powers as good as they defended for a number of years against a team who as the peak of their attacking powers are just so in sync and so in flow and seeing who's going to break first and I mean, no team really should ever defend for 36 phases without breaking, and somehow New Zealand did, and that was that was the difference. Yeah, and can you can you believe that, it? Can history. can you believe it in the 81st minute though? The man who's on the ground, who's in the ruck, who saves the day for New Zealand is Sam Whitelock. Like, how how can you yeah. write a script like that, right? <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, that's <laughs> like I guess that's all. That's like the World Cup just always throws up those big stories, and you have. Big Sam on how many is 140 something cap or something coming up with the big One, play. 150 just, plus, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, 150 plus, just ridiculous. Like, yeah, I guess that's sort of, I guess, epitomizes the All Blacks at the same time where the big players always step up in those big moments, and he was the most experienced of all time to come up with that big play. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to the semi final, and it was England for <laughs> South Africa and a. A bit of a bogey team, perhaps a bit of a um, you know challenge for South Africa. And I was reading a lot of the comments uh, from the people on this show heading into that game, and there was a lot of nerves in South Africa over that game because they thought that England could come in and disrupt the pattern. Well, how did you feel about going into that game? It was a weird one because obviously anyone I speak to would be like, oh, like especially being in the UK, it'll sort of, oh, you guys are going to hammer us this weekend, you're going to kill us. And I was a bit probably on the nervous side where. It was, you had all that pressure, you should win. But then the way England had been trying to play and you could see the team they were developing and the way they were playing was a way to nullify what South Africa was really good at. And obviously I, found, I felt, I said to people, if South Africa get on top early and score an early try, get 10 points ahead, we could win by 40 points easy because usually, uh, England don't really have the attack to chase a game just yet. But if England start well like they did, kicking game well, South Africa's discipline a little bit off, all of a sudden it's 3 six, nine, and you're like, now we've got to chase and sort of play into exactly how England's plan is, was just kick, kick, kick. I think they kicked five or six kicks more per game than anyone else in the tournament, something like that. And so sort of, you always just felt if they got that right and did, you had someone like Freddie Stewart who we kept kicking on, who was outstanding in the air. And then they sort of built momentum through doing the things that they had slowly built and got better and better and better at over the sort of year and a bit under Balthwick, the way they'd been developing. It was sort of as good as they'd been, I think, in that time against us whereas and we sort of just slipped off where kicks were just going short and just not on and thankfully you have someone you have like Rusty and Jacques who obviously people see him pulling off Marnie at 30 minutes and pulling off Sia at 41 minutes and but making these big early substitutes because they had such faith that maybe it's just not those boys day they'd been through Hallen back to beat France the week before it's someone else's turn to turn it around and big Ox and Ochis Neyman came through and sort of did the job on on England in that last 10 minutes. And I mean, I was like, I couldn't believe what I was watching because it was all my worst fears were coming sort of 10 minutes, each 10 minutes as it passed. I was like, surely this can't actually be happening. Like I was in a bit of disbelief. <laughs> and then Ochia scores and you sort of like, oh, there's a chance now. Yeah. And then sort of, you get that last minute, Freddie Stewart tries like sort of up and under where I said, if he just kicks long, we've got to run from all my worst fears were coming true and then so I managed to find a way. Big Ox, Big Ox and Ahia came through and then it was sort of the big showdown, I think probably the one deep down everyone really wanted South Africa versus New Zealand. Obviously coming into the tournament it was all probably Ireland, France, Ireland, France. But then from a southern hemisphere perspective, 
it's the biggest game in world rugby and the one I think that means the most that only <laughs> us as South Africans and Kiwis can understand how big a game it actually is. Yeah, exactly. And we didn't want uh, anybody winning the World Cup unless they, they beat us as well in the final. So that was uh, that's the way it went down. So how was uh, how was the final from your side of the fence? Pretty uh, pretty healthy, yeah? Yeah, oh, geez, it was a good, like, good game. It was obviously... Before the game, I was sitting, I happened to walk into like a pub and end up watching with like a Kiwi who was on the side and a few other guys. And I was sort of before, I was just hoping that there was actually no cards. There was nothing to take. Just go. Let's just see who's the best 15 on 15. And unfortunately, obviously, you have the Sam Kane incident and things like that, which sort of took an edge off, but then gave the game a whole different sort of flavor, I would say, and meaning. And you saw how the All Blacks dug so deep. South Africa tried to kill the game off that 10 minutes after halftime and didn't. And then it was a case of, felt like I was watching sort of the slow poison New Zealand would just kept coming and coming and eventually they were going to find a way to, to get over the line and thankfully South Africa hung on again and Andre's kicking was just outstanding and in the end it was those, those little things that made the difference because New Zealand had a couple of kicks that could have won them the game and didn't and that was just the smallest margins sort of ended up being the, 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 t- the story of this World Cup. Yeah, it was indeed, and it, it didn't matter whether you were watching uh, Portugal against uh, Fiji or whether you were watching France and uh, South Africa. Yeah, it was just those small margins at those critical times. Um, you know, we could have had completely different results here. Yeah? We could have seen France beat you guys, and we could have seen us go out as well by Ireland. So it could have been so, so different very easily, yeah? Exactly. Thankfully, we both lost our, our, our game in the first games of the World Cup, but then we turned it around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We lost at the right time. So tell me, what, what was your overall thoughts about the World Cup? And, uh, and I, ask, I ask you from a player perspective, but also from a spectator perspective, and have World Rugby got this right? Is, is this the greatest men's rugby tournament of all time, do you think? Oh, I think like there wasn't too much to complain about this particular World Cup. I thought it was outstanding. I think that obviously the the quality of the games just gave it that whole new that whole new level of just to put the the game on the map. But obviously then since then you've had bits and pieces. Where I don't know if you've seen on like social media where guys are trying to sort of post reviews of the World Cup and build the game outside of on social media because you need to in this with the generation coming through and everyone's on their phones. You need to utilize that and things like World Rugby pulling down pulling down videos because they've got the rights and you have such a good World Cup it should be blowing up all over the world and yet you're stopping people posting stuff on their Twitter accounts when they could be getting you 100, 200, 300, 500,000 views and who knows how much that exposure that leads to which is obviously the worrying side of not capitalizing on what was an outstanding World Cup. Yeah, yeah, good points and let's talk about that because I wanted to have a chat to you today also about World Rugby in particular who are supposed to be the the gatekeepers of the game and, and making the game grow across the world. What do you think are some of the most important issues for world rugby to address right now heading into 2024? I think after this World Cup on the back of seeing obviously new Fiji were going to be better. You've seen sort of the pr- improvement that's come just from giving them two years in Super Rugby. So getting a team like that in the rugby championship would probably be massive. And then helping other teams like the others, Samoa and Tonga, develop because if they get sort of the right infrastructures too, they'll just be like how Fiji are now. And then you look at Chile, Portugal, Uruguay, these teams just sort of came out of what people say relatively nowhere and were outstanding. You look at, imagine what they could do with with more support from World Rugby and really helping them grow the game, getting proper sort of, even if it's tier two competitions for the time being to help them grow. The team like Georgia needs to maybe be in the Six Nations or Seven Nations or something, or they've got to create I don't know, eight nations with two pools of four or something to, to grow the game this side because you have you have other teams that can become really, really good. But obviously it's, I guess, up top there, they're balancing between looking after the, the teams that bring in the money and building up teams who could then challenge them. And I guess, do they really want other teams coming forward and challenge them? Do they really want a, a Fiji team that could easily win the next World Cup if they give them more support and more games against the top, top teams? Yeah, yeah, good point. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, the TMO, the bunker system, the referees. Um, I've been absolutely uh, ashamed over the last couple of days when I've heard these stories about Wayne Barnes and how his family has received uh, death threats over the outcome of that game. I think that's absolutely disgraceful. And these are obviously coming from people that aren't true rugby supporters because that's not how the rugby community 
should be carrying on, right? So um, what, it, what are your views around the TMO situation at this year's Rugby World Cup? To be honest, I think that the, the bunker review system was a great addition just in terms of speeding up the game. They could have a look, send it upstairs, and then more often than not, you actually got the right decision because they could look at it properly for five, six, seven, eight, nine minutes and come to the best possible decision rather than having a ref looking at a big screen trying to decide at the time. So you have that side of things. Obviously, you get the other side where there's a lot of jumping in from the TMOs, which then slows the game down conversely. So you've got to find that balance. Like it's obviously in football now, it's crazy with VAR and the amount of wrong decisions you're still getting, by the, despite the fact that they have so much time to look at these these clips. So the bunker system I thought was really good, just purely from a yellow red card perspective, because it's such an easy system to to clear yellow. Yes, okay, get him off, and then you tell me if it's a red card. But then it's trying to find that balance where the TMOs can't be every two minutes, everything they see, check, 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 here's the potential high tackle, check, check, here's this, here, because it just gets too much and it ruins the game. And there's some things that need to be checked and some things that are 50-50, oh, it should be fine, or 60, like they should, unless it's a clear and obvious decision, I don't think they should get involved as much as they do. So are you sitting Are you sitting on the side that says, yes, it's a good system, but it just needs a bit more time to be refined? Is that what I'm listening to? Yeah, I, th well, I would say that. I think it needs a bit more time, and now they need to find sort of the, the I guess, the system they use to decide when TMO should get involved, when it has nothing to do with sort of if there's not a major effect on the game, things like that. Obviously, if it's foul play, it's foul play, but just little things that maybe at times they need to just see. But then it's... I guess you've got to find the balance. You have in like the final where they pick up the knock-on from the mall and obviously there's a try a few phases later. So you get the right decision that way, but then it will slow the game down. So it's just really finding that balance. I think the, the purely from the bunker system, the yellow-red card system, really good. And now it's just taking that next step to optimise it so it's as efficient and you still keep the quality of games. I think obviously the best games this World Cup, like the New Zealand the final, the two quarterfinals we spoke about, those France, New Zealand, the start of Africa, Ireland, were probably games where the refs and TMOs actually weren't involved that much and the games flowed and the quality was so high. If you can push that as much as we can, then you can get the best possible quality and result out of, out of the games. I heard an interesting comment made yesterday about um, the whole t TMO and intervention in the World Cup. And it was in the beginning of the tournament, we had amazing weather in France and the, the players were playing under these extraordinary warm conditions. We had the water breaks, of course, and all the rest of it. But then when the knockout stage came, we got rain for the first time in the World Cup. And as a result of that, there was more TMO intervention when the weather changed in the World Cup than it was in the beginning. That's an interesting one, yeah? Yeah, geez, I wouldn't even have thought about like mentioning something like that, but I guess... yeah. You then get a lot more contact, close contacts, and it's a bit wet. And then you get things like if I'm playing in the wet weather, you know, line speeds up. So then you're flying off the line. There's little errors, little slips here and there, which could end up resulting in what looks like a bad tackle or a bad shoulder, a bad clean out. And then you get you get that side of things too, or a few extra knock-ons that might not be picked up. So it probably is something too they need to maybe be aware of in trying to just see, like have a look at based on the, what you just said now, how it's affected the decision making or what led to what like what incidences were more in the wet that weren't there in the in the dry absolutely so mate tell me what's your preferred position at the moment we didn't talk about that at all so far through the show um jeez i've sort of been through it all my career i reckon i'll probably end up playing equal amounts from 15 wing 13 12 10 so it's been a mix i enjoy fullback sort of from a purely more space, like you get to see things from a different perspective, which I quite like. And, and a position like 10, 12, I really enjoy because you're involved all the time. So those are the two. At the moment for the rugby club, I've been playing 12 for a couple of weeks, which has been lots of fun just because you're involved in everything. And it's a cool position. So I guess probably throughout my career, it was probably something I maybe should have thought about specializing earlier, but then it benefited me loads, being able to play all the different positions as I went through, through yeah. my career because I was sort of help the team out wherever they needed me and cover cover multiple positions every weekend. So who was your favourite fullback at the Rugby World Cup this year? Um, I like I loved the way like Thomas Ramos is kicking just 
Like it just everything looks so in sync. I love the way he kicks. From attacking perspective, you probably obviously Damien Phillips is just crazy. Like he's crazy good. You got Bowden. Um, actually, good. I also like um, Hugo Keenan from from Ireland as well. So there's probably quite a few. It wouldn't be the one I would say is my super favorite. I just love watching Thomas Ramos kick a kick a rugby ball. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, he's fantastic, isn't he? His percentages were just something insane in that Rugby World Cup. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, uh, World Rugby, let's get back to that because I was really wanting to get you to tell me what you think World Rugby needs to do to up the game because uh, if you go online and if you have a look at a lot of comments in, in my uh, shows, you'll see that a lot of people are upset with World Rugby for all sorts of different reasons. And uh, they feel as though the game's not growing in the right direction. They feel as though those t- two second-tier nations are not getting the kind of investment. W- what do you think needs to be done? I think that's probably spot on. There's sort of a lot of people looking after themselves at the higher table and not seeing how you can grow the game lower on because you have teams, like we said before, you've seen how Fiji have grown from two years in Super Rugby. You can... Chile and Portugal and Uruguay have come under the World Cup and been outstanding. You've got a country like the USA, which should explode in a rugby world if given sort of the right backing and being in the right competition. So I think they've just got to find a way to integrate these teams to give them more playing, probably maybe the, the, the tier two teams in like proper competitions where they can play each other all the time. Because if you've got the Georgias and sort of Portugals and Tongas and Samoas playing each other more, they'll naturally get better because they're playing together more. And then within that, try and find ways to integrate games against Tier 1 nations because that's the only way they're truly going to get better. You've seen sort of Argentina since they've joined the Rugby Championship, now they're proper top top side and keep keep developing, whereas before that, they they were always just going to stay on that on that sort of outer sphere of, of the top team. So I think hopefully there's, there's been a bit of talk about maybe Fiji joining the Rugby Championship. That would be awesome to watch and just see how they got on because... They're always a fun team to watch. And then it's a case of how do they develop the team slower than that. I know, I think that was a funny thing. I don't know if you saw Russi's Twitter profile picture changed to, to Augustine Pichot. So I would like, because he's been quite a, he's had some bold ideas, big sort of plans to grow the game outside of outside of the top teams because obviously he's, he's come from Argentina. Like that's He's seen the, the benefit they can have. So I would love to see someone like him get a go at the top and see see how many of these ideas you can bring to life because obviously it's it's one thing having the ideas and then a whole other story being able to bring these ideas to life and really seeing how they can implement them and help help these teams grow but i'd love to see more teams get better and better because i mean imagine a world cup where you got three teams in each pool that are legitimately fighting to win it and could you could win that pool all of a sudden you got to really makes the world cup a whole different kettle of fish again which would be quite exciting yeah, and I, I, yeah, I agree with you. And I want to put out there this thought as well because I watched uh, a lot of the comments around, oh, we've got these cricket score games and we've got Romania getting beaten by 80 points and, and 70 points respectively and all this sort of thing. But when you actually watch those games as a true rugby aficionado, you can see that they're not too far away from being a good rugby side, right? They just need some good coaching and, and more time together against that good competition and they'll be right in there, right? And and let's face it, Italy got thrashed 90 points by the All Blacks, right? And they're a Six Nations team. So you can't talk about cricket scores when, when we're looking at this. But would you agree around that, that they're not too far away, some of these teams, from being good rugby teams? Oh, definitely. And if you think sort of people don't realise, I guess, outside of the game, if, if they understood sort of how the team was put together, that probably the whole team is made up of accountants and data. Like, if you took... The, the New Zealand and South African equivalent of those people. So you've got to take people in real jobs, put them together six weeks before tournaments and throw them in. And then they've got to play the South African equivalent of those people in from Romania or those they, like it'll be a different story and they would probably batter the, the, the South African or Kiwi version because they sort of are used to how that things work and how you how they've put together from nothing and got to sort of put together a game plan from relatively scratch and build it in little sort of two, three week periods sort of maybe three, four times a year over four years to then get to a World Cup where you might have a bigger thing. So I think people can't, like you can't underestimate how hard that is for those teams. If you look in like football terms, if a premiership team beats a League One team 5-0, people don't bat an eyelid because they're like, oh, well, they've got so much money in there. But then it's the same thing, like they're still a fully, fully professional team with players who just 
and another team who's funded with more money and that's why they're better. It's just one of those things. The, the better sort of infrastructures and more money these teams can have and more opportunities to play top teams, then they can develop. Without that, they're not going to develop and you can't expect them to turn up and play. These teams have played together year in, year out against the best teams. It just doesn't work like that. Like It's it's mm-hmm. impossible. It's not like you can't cancel the <clears throat> FA Cup because you get, every now and then you get that shock result which sort of opens people's eyes up. You can't just cancel that because you think, oh, what's the point in this lower league team playing this premiership football team? Because that's how you've got to grow the game and sort of find out where the next big thing's coming from and where the next teams you can actually properly develop are. Because otherwise, it's not, you look at a team like Bournemouth in the Premier League who've come from League Two sort of 10 years ago and now are mainstay in the Premier League. In a rugby terms, why can't you develop a Romania that in sort of eight years' time they're, they're sort of a top 10, top 12 rugby nation and they're really pushing Yep. Pushing the top teams, even like Georgia, George has shown what you can do when they get slightly more opportunities and slightly bit more money, and can actually develop themselves. Yep. Every team could follow that similar sort of model, but they need financial backing. They need proper professional structures within their country to then allow them to grow. If they don't get that, they're never going to properly grow because it's just not sustainable. Exactly right. Yeah, very very good points, and thank you for making them. I'm also an ambassador for what I believe should be uh, inaugurated within the World Rugby calendar each year is a Northern Hemisphere versus a Southern Hemisphere game. What do you think about that? I would love to watch that. I'm all for that. Yeah, because there's uh, so many great opportunities, isn't there, to get these Tier 2 players into these teams. And uh, I think also with the fan side of it as well, you know, there's so much hype now in the Northern Hemisphere about the quality of rugby, and quite rightly so, because it's very, very good. But uh, us Southern Hemisphere boys, we want to stick together, don't we, and see the best play the best as well. Oh, yeah, I'd love to see a Kiwi South Africa sort of Fiji and Aussie combo against England, France, Ireland, Scotland. That would be some, that'd be some, yeah. some effort that way. Absolutely. Okay, just two more things before I let you go today. The first one is, does rugby have a drugs problem? Oh, I think I actually saw you post about this the other day. <laughs> Um, oh. <coughs> to be honest, it's a tough one because obviously you, you, I saw what you said you made some valid points in terms of how far players have come and things like that. And I guess being in a professional system, I've seen that it doesn't take as much. People think you need to take all this special stuff to get to a certain point. But if there's if you're doing everything by the book perfectly and you're looking after yourself, the results you get can be can be really really good. And I think I don't think there's actually a drugs problem as maybe some people do think I think it's I think it's fine I just think the way teams have sort of developed themselves and the top top professional teams the way they look after themselves the recovery process they have in place the the um, durability they've built up from the way they train week on week on week on week has allowed teams to perform they do like this week on week out um, I think it's a little bit too easy to say oh they must be on something how can they do it I just think teams have come that far and conditioned that well and I've seen sort of First hand, the work that goes in behind the scenes to get these programs perfect for, and I say like GPS, heart rates, all that stuff. But they get they like to the number. If you a hundred me, hundred too many high speed meters this week, the next week they'll be like, okay, hang on, this Monday you might get pulled out with ten minutes to go in a session because they say you did too much last week. You balance that out again. They, there's so many small details which I think people like don't take into account. Where it just looks like how can these freaks of nature do this every week? But there's so many tiny details that go into the preparation and making sure, and saying like a World Cup time, they've had these two months together, so there would have been, let's say, four weeks of crazy fitness in gym, and then it would have been loads of rugby, balancing out, topping up what they've done to make sure they're in sort of peak condition to be able to go week on week on week, where actually in a, in a sort of a game week, you're going really chilled Monday, big Tuesday, off Wednesday, sort of a fast Thursday, chilled Friday, game Saturday. So you only got sort of three big days each week where you've got to be up for and train hard for. Outside of that, there's so much little things being done to make sure you're covered, to make sure your diet's perfect. You got, you're got putting all those little things in place. And I think when you find that perfect formula, you can actually achieve quite special things without without looking, saying obviously it could be a drug thing, but I just don't think. I think there's so many small things they've put in place now that that's, what's allowing them. And it's not sort of things they put in place two months before the World Cup or the World Cup. It's things they put in place two years ago that have just 
been going on bit by bit and those one percent you're adding every six months are giving that extra five ten percent come world cup time so for me i don't think there's a, there's a drug that's sort of it's too too easy a thing to say this the drugs from i don't think it's that i just think the process have, have evolved so much even in my time sort of i would say from the first time i was jersey to what it looks like now to, or to my first week at worcester to the last week or to how teams have evolved over time I think that's that's what's allowed the game to evolve in a way because everyone's right on the edge of finding the best technology, the best training methods, the best gym methods, the best sort of the best little things of everything. And I think this is, we're getting that culmination where now the the gaps are just going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That's exactly why I wanted to ask you, Scott. So we get it from the horse's mouth. So thank you for answering that. Now, last up today, what's the future hole for Scott? Where's he going next? What are you going to do, mate? What's on? What's in the pipeline? Um, so, me and my family, like I said before, we had always planned. Jersey was a place we wanted to settle down. Unfortunately, it's sort of professional rugby-wise. It might be the end if something short-term pops up in the next month or two. I'll consider it just to, I guess, end the professional game on my terms. But I've sort of, I guess because of everything I've been through before and sort of the advice I've got from people, I've come to terms with this quite quickly and being able to see the, the opportunities in the outside world in terms of getting in, whether it be the finance industry or change management or project management or things like that, um, putting myself out there, just seeing how the, the outside world works. And at the same time, I'm really enjoying playing for the rugby club again. It's completely fun. It's, you would laugh at to see sort of the, the people in the league each week it's a big uproar and because oh they got ex Reds players playing for the rugby club and I'm sort of like, Well, not professional anymore, like this is my choice. Like it's I don't know, like must I quit rugby because you don't like it that I'm here in Jersey and I love the place and I wanna contribute. Like it's one of those and I just it's so much fun being with like a bunch of boys who are just doing it for fun again. So you get that whole different perspective and I guess I'm being allowed to completely express myself again. You can sort of try things a little bit. You don't have to worry when things go wrong because it's all on your terms and there's just no, no pressure anymore. So I'm mean, really enjoying doing that and now sort of find out, find a big job wherever I go to in the next sort of hopefully few weeks, maybe the next month, dive into that and see how that goes. And all of a sudden next year I'll be able to play cricket throughout the summer because I don't have pre-season. I'll be able to play five-a-side football. I'll be able to play more golf. Like I'll be able to do all those things that you sort of forget about and it becomes so normal that you can't do them when you're playing rugby that you just forget it's a thing and all of a sudden you step outside and now I've got the freedom to do all these things again and you're like, hang on, this is actually quite a nice position to be in. And so so from that side of things, it will just be an exciting time to to come out. Obviously, I'll miss the professional rugby. You miss sort of that, the, the high intensity edge, the nerves you feel, those little bits and pieces get taken away, but then you can find them in different areas of life and sort of expand and enjoy on all the other things you, you forgot you could do because rugby was such a big part. Now it's just a case of Seeing, seeing what else is out in the big bad world that I'm quite excited to find out. Awesome, mate. It's great to hear your positivity and uh, you're right in looking at it that way. There's a lot of amazing opportunities in this world. Who would have thought that a uh, 58-year-old Kiwi guy be sitting in Cancun, Mexico, making a rugby show, yeah? <laughs> exactly that. Son. How good. Well, listen, it's been fantastic having you on the show today. I've really enjoyed it and uh, great to hear your personal journey, talk about the World Cup and all things rugby. So I just want to pass on my gratitude and thank you very much for coming on Inside Rugby with me today, Scott. Awesome, Mark. Thank you so much. It's been loads of fun chatting code. I could do this all day, so any time will be fun. I'll hold you up to that and uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on the show at some stage, mate. Awesome. That sounds good. Cheers, Mark. Have a good one. Enjoy Cheers, Mexico. mate. Mexico. Will do. So there we go, a really fascinating chat with Scott Van Breda from South Africa. It was really, really good talking to Scott in today's show. I hope you got a lot out of it. I found it very, very informative, interesting, and a really nice guy just to have a good long conversation with about our favorite sport. Now, if you like today's episode, why don't you give us a thumbs up? If you like it even more, why don't you hit the subscribe button because there's going to be plenty more coming right here on Inside Rugby with Mark. And I'm going to be back again really, really soon with some more content. Let me know some about uh, your thoughts around the things that Scott and I talked about. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have an opinion of yours you want to share? Bring it on. That's what this rugby channel is all about. Now, I'm going to be back again really soon with some more content. So until then, stay well, stay safe, everybody. And it's time for me to say bye for now.